Imagine the icy cold of the Arctic. A polar bear emerges from its den after months of hibernation. During the time, the bear will have lost one third of its body weight. For an average polar bear, that is as much as 150 to 200 kgs of weight. Remember that when we as animals breathe in, we take in oxygen, O2, but when we breathe out, it's carbon dioxide. That carbon we breathe out is how we lose weight. When it's hibernating, a polar bear is not eating food, which is made of carbon. So where is all the carbon coming from when it's breathing out during hibernation? It's from all the fat that it accumulated before it went to sleep. And once it wakes up, it's going to be pretty hungry. So it'll likely hunt down a seal and eat it. A seal can contain 50 kgs of fat under its skin. And the polar bear will eat it in one meal after waking up. That is the equivalent of a human being eating 12 large pizzas in one shot. Something that will make you really sick. But for the bear, eating, storing and using fat is the key to survival in one of the harshest environments on earth. A place where no plants and therefore no carbohydrates are to be found. Welcome to the science of fats. In this video, we'll keep our focus on the chemistry of fats and oils, their role in food, cooking and general health. We will not dig into deeper medical subjects like cholesterol, heart disease and hormones. That will be covered in a separate video. Our food is made up of three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins and fats. If you had to quickly describe the primary function of each of these in our diet, carbohydrates are for energy, protein is for structure and function and fats are for storage. But plants use starch, which is a carbohydrate for storage. So why didn't animals just use that? You see, plants always have access to food roughly every 12 hours because when there is sunlight, they can make food, sugars, using photosynthesis. But animals have to eat plants or eat other animals. So animals evolved a way to store excess energy when a lot of food was available and then use it like the polar bear does during hibernation when food is not available. And glycogen, which is the carbohydrate animals use as temporary fuel storage, holds a lot of water. So it's not very efficient. Fat stands out as the energy storage champion. Carbohydrates and proteins have 4 calories per gram. Fat packs 9 calories per gram. More than twice the energy density of carbs or proteins. This makes fat the ideal fuel for long-term endurance and survival in the animal kingdom. On a lighter note, if we had not evolved fat as the storage mechanism and only used glycogen, we'd all look like balloons. So fats are lightweight, compact and energy dense and allowed animals like us to store vast amounts of energy without being weighed down. To put things in perspective, we typically store 2000 calories worth of glycogen in our liver and muscles for immediate use. While an average 80 kg person with a body mass index of 30, which is just about obese, stores 185,000 calories in fat. While this seems like a problem in the 20th century, this evolutionary innovation actually allowed our ancestors to survive long periods without food and travel vast distances from a tiny squirrel to a human being to a majestic blue whale. Fat became the currency of survival in the animal kingdom. To understand how fat performs its energy storing feeds, we need to understand its molecular structure. At its core, a fat molecule is made up of a glycerol backbone and three fatty acid chains, forming a triglyceride. Fatty acids are long hydrocarbon chains, typically containing 12 to 22 carbon atoms, with a carboxyl group at one end. The number of carbon atoms 
and the presence or absence of double bonds between them determine the properties and classification of the fat. When all the fatty acids attached to glycerol have single bonds between all carbon atoms, they are called saturated fats. They are saturated with as much hydrogen as is possible. And three-dimensionally, these are straight molecules, so they can be packed on top of each other more efficiently. And that is why they tend to be solid at room temperature. Sometimes when books say room temperature, they use a Western standard, which is 18 Celsius. Room temperature in Chennai can be 32 or 33 Celsius. So this is why ghee and coconut oil, which are both mostly saturated fats, tend to be solid in Delhi during winter and liquid during summer. In Chennai, they are liquid all through the year. When the fatty acids have one or more double bonds, they're called unsaturated fats. The molecules with carbon-carbon double bonds tend to be bent. And bent molecules don't stack together well. And therefore, liquids at room temperature. When they have only one double bond, they're called monounsaturated fatty acids, MUFAs. And if they have two or more double bonds, they're called polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs. Now, one thing to remember, most of the fats we use are never 100% saturated, monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. They are always a mix of all three in some proportion. We simply use the term for whatever is the majority. So here is a table of common cooking fats in India and their mix of saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats. So as you can see, ghee, coconut oil, and palm oil are called saturated. Mustard and olive oil are called monounsaturated, while sunflower and safflower oil are called polyunsaturated. But let's ask the most obvious question. What does all of this mean for our health? Which of these three categories of fats is healthy? Therefore, what oil should I use? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. There is evidence for good and bad for all combinations of fats. So the honest truth is that you can be healthy or unhealthy regardless of what cooking oil you use. The amount of fat in your diet is way more important than the choice of fat. If you overconsume fat, even the most expensive extra virgin olive oil from Italy is bad for you. That said, here is the current state of the science and to best explain the fundamental complexity and difficulty in giving simple yes-no answers when it comes to fat, I'm going to use South Indian movie references. Monounsaturated fats, the middle column, is like Rajnika. He does not do negative roles. Most of the scientific evidence suggests that monounsaturated fats are broadly good for you, provided you don't overconsume, of course. Polyunsaturated fats are like Kamal Hassan. He has been known to do hero roles as well as villain roles. So polyunsaturated fats can be both good for you in some situations and bad for you in other situations. To understand this better, we need to dig into Kamal Hassan, sorry, polyunsaturated fats a bit more. If the first double bond is at the third position from the end of the molecule, which is called omega because that's the last letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha to omega. These are called omega-3. If the first double bond is in the sixth position, it's called, you guessed it, omega-6. Omega-3, great for you, but more on that later. Omega-6 can be good, but research suggests that if the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in your overall diet is higher than 4 is to 1, then it's not good for you. Modern Western diets that exclusively use sunflower or soybean oil, which are very rich in omega-6, end up distorting this ratio. So this, like many Kamal Hassan movies, is complicated. Then we get to saturated fat. Till rather recently, saturated fats were like MN Nambiar, pure villain, bad for your heart. But it is now clear that it's more complicated than that. So saturated fats are like Fahad Fasil. It's hard to figure out whether he's the good guy or bad guy in a movie. 
but there is a slightly higher chance that he is going to turn out to be the bad guy. So the WHO and most nutritional experts suggest that people keep saturated fats to 7 to 10 percent of your daily calories. Now that you know who is Rajnikanth, who is Kamal Hassan and who is Fahad Fasil, the idea is to try and consume a mix of fats in your diet. A mix of mostly monounsaturated and polyunsaturated and for special occasions, saturated fats. Even saying this can be controversial because in many parts of India, people will swear by just one fat. Ghee, they will claim, is a superfood. Keralites will claim that there is no need for anything other than coconut oil. Bengalis will swear by mustard oil. But remember, ghee itself has 29% monounsaturated fat. So don't really break your head. Go back to what I said earlier. Focus on overall amount of fat in your diet. And if that is in moderation, then what fats you eat does not matter as much. You can ignore every influencer trying to tell you that only one thing is the greatest fat. A quick side note on omega-3, since a lot of people have doubts about this. This is a type of polyunsaturated fatty acid that is essential for human health. There is good evidence that omega-3 improves heart health, brain function, immunity, reduces inflammation and so on. There are three of them. One, ALA, alpha linolenic acid. This comes from plants and the human body cannot make it so you have to include this in your diet. The best sources are flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts and soybeans. 2. EPA, Icosa pentaenoic acid. 3. DHA, Docosa hexaenoic acid. So ALA you have to eat and EPA and DHA can be made inside your body using ALA but we are not very good at it. There are some factors involved here. One, women produce EPA and DHA from ALA much better than men. If your diet is very heavy on omega-6 fatty acids, that can inhibit the conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA. Remember I told you about why keeping the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio to under 4 is to 1 is important? This is one of the reasons why. Three, as always, some people convert it better. So you might ask, no big deal, why not just eat EPA and DHA? You can, but it's only found in some kinds of fish. So if your diet includes seafood, you should be okay, right? Well, it's not that simple either. It turns out that it's cold water fatty fish like salmon, trout, that are rich in omega-3. These fish are not common in the warm waters in the coast of India. So just because you eat seafood does not automatically mean you're getting a lot of omega-3s. Two exceptions, searfish and anchovies, the really small ones, are pretty decent sources. The rest, not so much. But what if you don't eat fish? Speak to your doctor and consider omega-3 supplements like cod liver oil. But keep in mind that those tend to be rich in vitamin A and D as well. Those are fat soluble vitamins and over consuming both of those vitamins can cause problems as well. So while omega-3 is the good stuff, trans fats are bad for you. So you now know that fats can be saturated or unsaturated and that unsaturated fats tend to be liquids at room temperature. So the food industry historically preferred to use saturated fats in packaged foods because they are solids and last longer. But they tend to be expensive like butter or animal fat. Back in the day, the food industry wanted to see if they could take cheaper plant-based oils which are unsaturated and make them unsaturated by pumping in hydrogen and turning those carbon-carbon double bonds into single bonds. This process is called hydrogenation. Great in theory, except it was not till much later that we found out that this process left behind some double bonds but changed their 3D structure. Remember that our unsaturated fatty acids had a bend. Those were the cis configuration. During hydrogenation, some of the double bonds became trans and those tended to be solids. Just one problem, trans fatty acids are bad for your heart. Long story short, since then, most countries have banned the presence of trans fats 
in processed foods. Do note that animal sources of fat will naturally have some amount of trans fats and in an overall balanced diet, it's not considered a risk. The industry has also significantly improved hydrogenation as a process to reduce the amount of trans fats produced. In India, the FSSAI has put an upper limit of 2% trans fats in processed foods. Fun fact, it is because of this trans fat problem that the use of palm oil exploded in the last few decades. Because one, it is naturally saturated. So hydrogenation is not required. Two, it is really cheap. All right, let's now debunk some of the most common myths about fat. One, eating fat makes you fat. Not true. Excess calories from carbs, protein or fat can lead to weight gain. In fact, diets that include fats have been shown to be more effective for long-term weight management than low-fat diets. Two, saturated fats are unhealthy. Not necessarily. Certain saturated fat-rich foods like coconut oil or grass-fed butter and ghee contain beneficial compounds like medium-chain triglycerides and conjugated linoleic acid that have been associated with positive health outcomes. Three, palm oil is unhealthy. Not true. Just look at our table again. Palm oil is a saturated fat like ghee or coconut oil. You can't claim ghee and coconut to be superfoods and palm oil to be a villain. You can't have it both ways. The reality is they are all fats. Good in moderation, bad in excess. The thing to keep in mind about palm oil is that because it's low cost, it's in all your snacks. So be mindful of overconsumption. Four, refined oils are unhealthy. Not true. Refined oils simply have a longer shelf life because anything other than fat has been filtered and removed from the oil. In fact, it's best to use refined oil for high temperature situations like deep frying because they will not burn at those temperatures, while cold press oils will burn. Also, refined oils are fortified with fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, and E in India. You can watch my video on this. Five, you must not reuse cooking oil. As you heat oils, they oxidize and over time go rancid. If you filter your used oil and store it in dark conditions, you can reuse them. Avoid reusing them too many times, that's all. Six, the most Western food influencers, most annoying fear mongering. Seed oils are unhealthy, they are fine. Humanity has been consuming seed oils like sesame, mustard, and groundnut for centuries. And multiple studies have shown that seed oils are fine. Seven, nowadays, there is a trend of no oil cooking. That is not good for you. Your body needs a minimum amount of fat every day. Your body can absorb essential fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K only if you consume fat. So let me end with this fascinating story. Remember, I told you that carbs were for energy, protein for function, and fats for storage. Well, that's not the full story. I wanted to keep the focus of this video on cooking oils and change your perception that having some fat in your body is a bad thing. When there are three fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule, we call it triglyceride. You can also have two and a phosphate group, and these are called phospholipids. And scientists believe that nearly 4 billion years ago, deep under the sea, near hydrothermal vents, where the water is warm and energy is freely available, that molecules like RNA and proteins got trapped inside a phospholipid membrane and ended up creating the planet's first form of life, a cell that was able to do metabolic activity while being protected from the water by the one thing everyone knows does not mix with water, Every cell in our bodies today have the same membrane made of phospholipids. Life is pockets of order protected by fat in a universe of chaos.